Hi, Julian DeRosier here from the IIF. We are currently at the Mining in the Bat 2022 in Cape Town, South Africa. I am joined with Doug Engdahl, CEO, President of the Axum Group. Doug. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Julian. How are you doing? Very, very good. So before we go into, into what your company provides as services, how good is it to be able to meet, to be able to be in person, walking away from those two little hard years, I could say? Uh, being face-to-face -face and meeting people is uh, what it's all about. So it, it's, it's fantastic uh, to get back to no some sort of normalcy, for sure. Absolutely. And in the meantime, we saw the price of commodities rising drastically. Mining sector is heating up. Um, it puts a lot of pressure on the services company. So maybe you can tell us a little more what Axum Group is, is doing and what's your field of expertise. Yeah, yeah. The the commodities are prices are rising. The exploration uh, initiatives are uh, intensifying around the world. There's a lot of uh, geopolitically driven uh, uh, motivations for that, and uh, the EV revolution, uh, to name a few. Uh, but uh, you know, Axum. Uh, is formed uh, in 2011. It's in its incipient stages. It was uh, an oil and gas well site geological company. But in 2018, uh, we diversified into a multi divisional, multi industry uh, service and consultancy. So we're an employee owned company based in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. And uh, we are about 100 geologists and geophysicists and environmental engineers. So yeah, we noticed a, a, a need in the market for um, a one-stop shop, if you will. Uh, and uh, our focus was more on advancing technology for exploration uh, techniques to modernize the toolbox uh, to order to make exploration more efficient, more effective, uh, both, in, both in its uh, its accuracy and, it, and its, its cost. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this is interesting because you earlier discussed a bit or, or touched the subject, you know, energy transition. But I mean that that is really, really going in parallel with what I would call a technology revolution in the mining world. We're starting to see automation coming in the mines. We're starting to use uh, more drones, more advanced equipment that you could basically see in different sectors of the economy being used. Maybe that's also the point of the background in oil here. A lot of technology that was used in oil that are now in transferring in the mining world. And so can you tell us exactly data, mining? Usually people are, it, it's an old industry. You go down, you take the core, you take it out. Where's the data come in? Where does your company add some value to the services that you provide? Yeah, you're right. The, a lot of the technology and, and investment has been in, in, in technology in the oil and gas sector. And it's, it's left the, the, the hard rock uh, exploration and mining sector uh, in, in, in second place and behind in technology. So, you know, with what we're dealing with right now, with the, you know, the, the labor shortage uh, yeah. that we see during uh, COVID, uh, a lot of people transitioned out uh, of, of the industry uh, looking for new careers. And then the, the wave of, uh, of, of, of the past where it was, you know, the gray hairs, you know, the, the knowledge that they had in an analog era is not transferred over um, into, into the youth that's coming in. So there, there is a big gap. So Doug, we were discussing a bit about uh, the gap of, of knowledge, transfer of knowledge. Um, and, and this is very theoretical, but basically you guys are boots on the ground. Am I right? That's where we started. That's not where we are today, though. Okay, so your company evolved from being boots on the ground, providing services, and now I hear more about AI, about in incorporating advanced technology, advanced algorithm and so on, into what you were doing normally, just on the ground, maybe the old-fashioned way. So what's your new fashion way? Well, yeah, you're right. Um, so AI actually was, was actually established like in the 50s and 60s, uh, if we're going to be accurate. And a lot of people yep. throw that AI, artificial intelligence word around, that catchphrase where the real power is, is in the machine learning and the deep learning. Uh, so, and you're right, data is power. So uh, with all of our projects around the world, and as we collect more data and more data, we, a lot of people aren't using that data in the correct way. So, you know, we talk about uh, you, the shortage of, of commodities to supply the EV revolution. We're going to be in five, ten years, we're, we're, we're going to be at a, a huge uh, roadblock because of all the other initiatives and technology is advancing, the supply and demand is not going to be met. So uh, what do we do? Do we keep doing things the same way? Do we keep just drilling for core, doing your typical geophysics and not advancing the technology at all? No, I, I, we, we will fail. And, and taking up, uh, taking up 
on that specifically. So what can be done differently? What are you guys doing differently? What are you looking at as gathering data differently than what was done seven or eight years ago? It's a good question. So we have a, a macro to micro approach in our exploration initiatives. And you know, technology is great, but if it's not economical, if the cost is too great, then it serves no purpose. So as, as you know, uh, the feasibility of mines before they, uh, they go into production, uh, they, they want more and more and more data de-risk. Well, that costs more and more and more money. Yeah. So over the past five years, we've developed some, some spectral al algorithms that we use uh, from satellite as our first pass, uh, collecting uh, every sort of alteration feature, uh, collecting uh, metal stress vegetation when there is no outcrop, and we can deploy that anywhere around the world. And we use that as a first pass. But then what we do is we go by a proximal discovery, uh, whether it be a drilling discovery or an ongoing mine. And because we can go back in time, we can go back 10, 20 years before the disturbance of man was there, and we can look at the, the signature and create an analog through the alteration signatures, metal stress vegetation, and even strip the trees away and look at potential structural controls. And then with our machine learning, we create analogs in the property of interest, and we identify smaller areas where then you have to deploy boots on the ground, really speeding the process up two, three years, depending on what kind of uh, operational season you have. So basically it's money well spent, it saves more money, it saves more time, and it's made the entire industry more efficient, especially in the, as you were saying, and on the exploration phase, and this is maybe where the gap is right now. We're lacking of projects, a lot of exploration going on, we have to catch up with the demand, as you said, the supply has to be there within a few years, and the countdown is already on. This is true, and from an exploration standpoint, like, that, that's the value we add, to accelerate that. There is going to have to be change in government initiatives, you know, to uh, to uh, n not go away from, our, I think the ESG, where we're going with the ESG initiatives is what we have to do, but they have to be more efficient and more supportive in, in exploration activities and, and from exploration from greenfield, brownfield to the mining stage. So it has to be a collaboration between government and techniques used. Absolutely. When, when, when government sets metrics or KPIs to, to, to get to, it has to go the entire way down, all the way from, from, from exploration, all the way to market. And I mean, this is where exactly right now we can see that there's a huge interest in the mining com community, getting the government more involved in early stage, where the risk is very high, but where the rewards are also very high, and where, as we see right now, there is a big, big trend into supply security, into bringing back mining maybe a little more in their hometowns, maybe more, a little more in their own countries, and securing that supply chain for the energy transition and the minerals of tomorrow we're needing. Yeah, that's right. So at, at Axiom, we understand that. So I sit on the Critical Mineral Council of Canada. So we can sit here and, and preach about the government needs to be better or the provincial regulations or, or federal regulations. But like if, like if you don't go out and vote, you can't complain about the leadership. Exactly. If you don't get involved in it and provide your knowledge, uh, then really you have nothing to say. So we get involved in, in the different ministries, provincially, federally, and in any organization we can in order to help aid that. Absolutely. And maybe now going back a bit to what we were seeing, um, you're privately owned. Yes. You're, you're em employee owned, I should add. That's even, even better. Um, in the current world, how, how do you maintain your employee base and how do you grow as competitors are fetching mm -hmm employees left and right and what do you have as Axiom Group to your employees as a little retention I would say. Yeah it's a, it's a good point. Uh, retention of, of, of qualified staff is, uh, is difficult. Uh, uh, staffs being poached left right and center uh, and it's not as, at a sustainable uh, uh, wage or salary. So uh, what we do is we invest back into our employees. We provide them PMP designations. We have other training centers where we bring PhDs and subject matter experts in to further their, their, their knowledge, their CV. Uh, and uh, we put all of our profits back into our, our staff uh, through bonuses and other incentives. Uh, take this conference for example. Uh, we, we, we brought uh, I think uh, eight or nine of our, of our key uh, senior staff here just for the experience just to, uh, uh, I, know, I guess, take care of our staff in a way that uh, 
don't know, in a way that is not normal in the industry. So I think I think it's a Richard Branson uh, quote where it says, uh, you know, uh, 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 train and, and arm your staff uh, so they can leave you and go anywhere and they will stay. Yeah. And uh, I think that's proven to be true with, uh, with Axiom as we continue to grow. The other way is uh, through acquisitions as well. So uh, we, we, we're also uh, doing a number of different acquisitions around the world. Absolutely. And maybe lastly, your footprint in the world. Where are you operating? Well, we, we were expanding outside of Canada. We, we, we started in Canada and the United States. And then uh, we were into uh, Northern Africa and uh, parts of South America and Europe. But uh, after COVID hit, we reduced our boots on the ground uh, footprint. And we started to use a lot more of our remote sensing so we can continue to build, you know, the desktop sort of work that we can do. And as the restrictions have left, now we are uh, operational in Africa, we're in, into Saudi Arabia, uh, Oman is in some in incipient stages, and uh, we're looking at moving down into Central America as well. That sounds great. So, Doug, thank you for your time. If future clients or future employees want to reach you, any presence online? Online, uh, our website is uh, www.axiomex.com, uh, that's A-X-I-O-M-E-X.com, and uh, we have a portal there to reach out to us. We have a couple of other websites. Uh, we're into some agriculture and forestry with the same spectral algorithms that we use in our mineral exploration. That's another website. It gets confusing when you try to understand all of what Axiom Group does. But one thing is sure, it's worth to look. I invite you to go uh, on the web page if you want more information. Doug, thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Julian.